Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the European Union Contest for Young Scientists 2020-2021, organized by the University of Salamanca and the Ministry of Universities here in Salamanca, Spain. I am honored to host this roundtable with this magnificent scientist who will discuss the challenges that you, the young talent, the young scientist, will face in our world. But first of all, in this point, I would like to say hello as well to those who are watching us through the virtual platform UCIS has created for this edition this year, 2021. This is a virtual platform uh, in which the participants can watch us three. So we have to say hello to all of you and thank you for being with us this afternoon. Uh, as well, I would like uh, you to know that if you want to participate with us, you can send us your questions by using Twitter and you have to use the hashtag uses2021 if you want to send a question to one of these scientists uh, who are here with us, with us um, this afternoon. Let me introduce now, one by one, these scientists and then they will address together hot topic discussion about climate change, artificial intelligence, pandemics and pseudoscience. Thanks to all of you for being here today. Thank you. Please join me, first of all, in welcoming our first participant, Professor Adolfo García Sastre. Thank you for being here. He is Professor of Medicine and Microbiology and Director of the Global Health and Emerging Pathogens Institute at the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. Besides all the multiple uh, achievements, as virologist, he has contributed to investigate the development of antivirals and vaccines against COVID-19. So please, the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you. We're looking forward to hear you. Okay, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Happy to be here to discuss about present and future, about some challenges in science. And uh, first, I'm gonna briefly tell you a little bit about what I'm doing and uh, what is my research about. So I hope that is coming my presentation here. They told me to wait 15 seconds till this starts. So I'm gonna start a little bit before uh, I start to talk, but hopefully you will see now that in the center of my research is viruses. Viruses have always fascinated me. I'm working with viruses for now 35 years. And viruses are always uh, thought about it as the, the bad guys that cause epidemics, pandemics, outbreaks, and chronic infections. What we try to do through research is studying viruses in order to figure out what are the virulence profiling. Not all the viruses are virulent. Not all the viruses cause disease in order to find improved vaccines uh, that may help uh, against uh, virus infections that cause problems, immunotherapies, uh, viruses can be used also in immunotherapy as I will show you, and also in order to find novel antivirals. And I will cover a little bit briefly some of, the, some of these things. So one of the things that interests me is influenza. And as you know, in 1918, there was a huge pandemic, even worse than the pandemic that we are having right now, that caused 50 million deaths worldwide at a big dip in the expectancy of life in the whole world. This is the US life expectancy. And this virus disappeared. Why did it disappear? Because it was never isolated. Why it was never isolated? Because it was not even known that flu was caused by a virus. It took forever to find, 20 years to find the causative agent of influenza, while it took less than one month to find the causative agents of SARS-CoV-2. But now we have reverse genetics techniques that we develop it with, from cDNA based on the genome of the virus, you can rescue the virus, and that's what we did. And we were able to sequence the virus from remainings of people that were still uh, preserved since 1918, that died of influenza. And we actually rescued this virus and the by containment and started to study. And what we learned about this virus, well, that was a very unique virus. There is no influenza virus that we know of that is like the 1918. And this is not due to one single thing. It's due to multiple polymorphisms in the virus genome that makes it very difficult that the virus like this will happen again. But we never can say that it will not happen again. 
We know now some of the th things that contribute to the virulence, and that's some things that we are looking in flu viruses, whether they have it or not, in order to be able to predict some about their virulence. Now, uh, the other th interest that I have is finding which host factors are important for virus replication and pathogenesis, because these are potential targets for antiviral intervention. And for that, we have done studies together with Nevan Krogan on the SARS-CoV-2, taking all the proteins of the virus, determining the host proteins that they interact with, more than 300 proteins, and now using these proteins that most likely help the virus to replicate as potential targets for drug intervention. And we find one drug that find, binds to one target, that one host factor that interacts with the virus that is required for virus replication is EEF1A, and the drug plitidepsin is able to inhibit viral replication, both in tissue culture and in primary cells, as well as in mice, mice that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and then are treated with plitidepsin or with remdesivir, the, the, which is the drug that is being in use. They have less viral replication and le they have also less uh, uh, disease in the lungs. So there is more pneumonia in the case of no treatment and there is less pneumonia in the case of the treatment with plitidepsin. And this is right now in phase three clinical trials. We are also interested in vaccines, and we are developing actually one vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 that is based on a viral vector that can be grown, like influenza viruses, in eggs. And that means that there is a huge capacity to produce this vaccine that we hopefully, if it works, will be able to be distributed and produced even in countries that are developing countries. And the idea is to use this as a vaccine similar to adenovectors, and uh, we inserted the gene into the genome of this virus, which is chicken virus, Newcastle disease virus, that is harmless for humans, and is now in phase one clinical trials in Vietnam, not only in Vietnam, also in Thailand, in Mexico, and in Brazil. And according to the results, we'll see whether we can move forward and come out with a vaccine that is more affordable for COVID-19. And finally, we are also using viruses to treat cancer. Why is that? Because viruses, when they have in contact with cells, they produce any immune stimulation. And by getting in contact with cancer cells, they make the tumors what is called hot, and this allows the immune system to be able to clear the, the tumor more easily. And that's another area of research that we are using with viruses. So by learning from viruses, we can do all these type of things. It's a very exciting area of research, especially with the new tools that we have right now for research. And I just want to finish saying thank you. And obviously, let's get vaccinated because it's the best way right now how to control this pandemic. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor. How interesting. Um, we will be back to you in a few minutes to keep on talking. Our next speaker is full professor of the Spanish National Research Council. She's Laura Alzua. Welcome, Laura. She is also group leader at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology and at Networking Biomedical Research Center in Barcelona as well. As a worldwide innovator and pioneer in the area of diagnosis and nanotechnology in the development of uh, nanobiosensors for the detection of uh, diseases, um, and during this pandemic, she focused her efforts on developing a simple, low-cost and, and, uh, and fast biosensor to detect COVID-19. So this is your turn, Lara, please. Welcome. Um. Hello to everybody. So it's my pleasure to be here to be able to share this uh, roundtable with this uh, distinguished with all my colleagues. But before that, I am going to ask to explain to you just a little bit about my, res my research. My, re my research that is uh, focusing on diagnostic. And what means diagnostic if my presentation is coming? So we have to wait just a little bit. Yes. Uh, so we are going to explain. I just want to explain to you what is the status of the diagnostic just now but especially what we have to do to achieve a real diagnostic and a more efficient diagnostic in the future. Okay, so if my presentation is coming, okay. Yes. So on. this is the future of diagnostic. I call this point of care biosensory and try to convince you that the point of care biosensing technology is the only one, the technology, that can accomplish the future that we need in the diagnostic. And why I'm saying that? Probably you have seen during the pandemic what happened during the pandemic. We have seen, uh, okay, 
that, uh, for example, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we have a very long lines of people just waiting to get a PCR analysis. And also, they are waiting also a long time, even now, to get the PCR result. And this was mainly due because all these PCR techniques are completely centralized in laboratories. So we need a specialized technician, we need a specialized laboratories, we need a long time to get the result. So this is the problem that uh, just today we have ever, I mean, excellent techniques to make any kind of diagnostic, cancer diagnostic, infection diagnostic, whatever. But the main problem, they are completely centralized. So they are always centralized in a hospital, in a laboratory facility. And we have seen in the pandemic that this is having a real problem because we cannot do a massive diagnostic of 7,000 million of people at the same time with this centralized diagnostic. So what is the solution? So in my opinion, what we are trying to do, the people like me working in this area, is uh, to make to offer a solution where you can make these very small devices that we call point of care testing devices, where you can deploy, for example, a drop of saliva, a drop of your urine, a triar, a drop of your blood, and then you put in this very small device, and then you can have a very instant diagnostic, a very reliable one. This is important to notice that we want to develop. It's a sophisticated uh, machine where you can have this very fast result, but at the same time that the, the result is complete, completely reliable. We call this point of care testing, and there is also just some few examples that, that, that are now in the market. For example, perhaps you have seen these people wearing this uh, portable, but wearable biosensor. The diabetic people are having this wearable biosensor where they have an instant diagnostic of the glucose level that they have in, the, in their blood. Okay, so my work is centering on this, in making these biosensor devices, and just making a very brief explanation of what is a biosensor device, because we say biosensor means a sensor measuring a biological molecule, and this is not the definition of a biosensor. In a biosensor, it's an intelligent device where you just join a biological molecule in contact with a device. And this biological receptor, this biological molecule, is completely selective to the protein, to the DNA, to the, uh, to the virus, to the bacteria that you want to detect in a sample. So means that you have to join two completely different worlds, a, a world from the biology and a world from physics or engineering. They have to be together. We have uh, some example. With the most famous one is the glucose biosensor that millions of diabetic people is using every day, uh, even at home. And you know, probably all of you know this device. There is also more simple biosensor, for example, pregnancy test that I am sure that many people have used. Uh, the, of course, we have all the COVID-19 tests. Uh, we have this antigen test, the serological test. We have many other on the market. We, do, do, we don't have too many. So our uh, research is mainly focusing on how are we able to produce all these point-of-care testing devices for many diseases, not only for this glucose or for a simple test like the pregnancy test. So this is one of the technologies that we develop, are very sophisticated technologies using nanotechnology and mainly nanophotonics, and then we are able to produce devices like that where you can prepare your biosensor for, this, uh, for, for deploying this tiny sample blood, serum, urine, tears, and then you can have an instant diagnosis and also you can connect very easily with your mobile phone. Okay, so this is what we are doing, so trying to do not only the fundamental science, not only the physics, how to make the sensor, but we have to make a complete engineering device where you have to join many multidisciplinary research. So we need people from biology, people from medicine, we need uh, engineers, we need physicians, we need chemists. And this is the good thing of this research area because we have to put all the knowledge together to be able to produce this biosensor. This, uh, you can see here some of the biosensors that we are producing in my lab. Look at the size. I mean, look how in this very small chip, microelectronic chip, we are able to have even six biosensors or even more in parallel. And then we can then incorporate this in an instrument to do all kinds of measurements. Uh, during the pandemic, my group has been involved in one, one of the first funded European projects. And then we have been able to produce a biosensor for virus detection, 
we are detecting the complete virus. This is not an antigen test, as the one that you have done. Until now, we are detecting the whole SARS-CoV-2. And our biosensor is able to say in a very small sample if you have or not the virus, but also we are able to say how many virus you have. And this is very important to have the number of the viral load. So we are able to know if a person has from 100 to 10 to 7 virus per milliliter. And this is making a difference for the medical doctor to know how to treat a patient depending on the viral load that the, this person has. The time to result is only 15 minutes. And we are completely selective. We have already checked to the present to other uh, coronavirus, different coronavirus. And we have also developed a biosensor for serological detection as, as well. It's not only to give yes or not the test, the serological tests that are commercially available at this moment. We are able also to provide a number, a quantitative number. This person has produced this number of immunoglobulins. So you can see also in the graphic how we have the control and we don't see that the people have any immunoglobulin. But then depending on the pattern, we have the different levels so we can quantify. And this is also very important, for example, for all the patients vaccination campaign to know, I mean, what is the best doses for each patient. And we have also a time to result in 15 minutes and excellent sensitivity. So in my opinion, and this is my last slide, I am completely convinced that the diagnostic is, the, is, uh, is one of the key points, I mean, the key steps in medicine. And in the future, we are going to, to need this portable diagnostic. So we need to have uh, devices, this point-of-care biosensor devices that you can do a test in anywhere, in any time, that you can do, for example, even at home, in an emergency unit, when you go to see your family doctor, when you go to even to the school, to your office. And then we can expand the utility of all these technologies for the early cancer diagnostic, for allergy diagnostic, even to, look, to know if the food that we are going to eat has some contaminants. Uh, of course, I mean, there is also a big, a big problem with the infections, with the bacteria, and the, with the antibiotic resistance, with environmental pollution. So everything can be done with all this technology. And then we have, we can't forget the concept that everything has to be centralized in a laboratory and we need to produce all this technology. In my opinion, this is the only way that in the future we are really well prepared to probably for the next pandemic, for the, for the next problem that we are going to face uh, for sure. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Laura, for your explanation. How interesting. We are looking forward to hearing more of you in a few minutes, so thank you. Let me welcome now other recognized scientists. He is Samuel Sánchez Ordóñez, um, Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies Research Professor and Senior Group Leader and Deputy Director at the Institute for uh, Bioengineering of Catalonia in Barcelona. Uh, he's also Honorary Visiting Professor at Harbin Institute of Technology in Shenzhen in China. Top researcher in nanoscience, his research focuses on the design of self-propelled um, nanobots that, for example, can navigate within the human body to transport drugs and, and treat tumors and other diseases. So, please, Samuel, if you could turn. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to uh, the organizers for inviting me here to, to be in this uh, amazing round table with uh, top experts. And, and it's a pleasure to be in front of a young audience. I really love uh, talking in this, in this crowd, in this type of, of environment. So it's really good to, to have mentoring and try to explain how do we see the current science uh, situation and how do we see the future. So I'm chemist by training. So now, now the challenge will be now I'm not going to talk about COVID. So we are not working on, on COVID actually in our lab. So let me go back to this. So what I'm going to tell you about is about nanorobotics. Um, actually, that's the challenge, right? So a chemist doing nanorobotics is a, a thing that is not, not easy to understand, but it's full of, of people behind me in a, in a multidisciplinary group. So I have to uh, acknowledge them. Uh, first of all, it's a teamwork here. So here, my, my title is a bit uh, uh, 
uh, also for the audience, right, like, I, like Jason here, like Revolution 4.0 in medicine. It's a little bit of artificial intelligence, it's, it's materials, it's engineering, it's chemistry, it's physics, and going towards medicine. So what we want actually to do is to mimic nature. Right? I'll tell you a lot about how can scientists copy what nature does. So here there are two videos of two different swimmers. One is a bacteria, and another one is a self-propelled uh, nanoparticle. It's an artificial swimmer that is moving in solution. So maybe, so I typically ask this to the audience, so typically people don't know how to answer, like which one is real, which one artificial. I will make your life easy here. I will tell you that this is on the right side, what is the Guinness record from our group, so that's the smallest artificial machine ever uh, synthesized. It's of the size of a bacterium. So this is just to tell you that we can do things like, like in living systems. But that's something that we didn't make up right now. So like many years ago, uh, uh, Richard Feynman uh, made this talk. There's plenty at the room at the bottom saying that why don't we make a nanomachine and then come into the human body and cure some diseases. He got the Nobel Prize in Physics 1965. And since then, many scientists were working and also not science, but also uh, in, 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 well, well, this movie now. So we have science and art, right? And then we can see some movies, this classical movie for uh, Fantastic Voyage. The senior people in the audience might remember a more new movies like how to make tiny submarines. So imagine that you can make a tiny submarine, can go inside the body and do what they, they wanted to do. This will be really amazing, right? But how does a nano robot look like? If you ask Google, Google knows everything, but here Google is wrong. So this is not possible to do at the scale. The only thing that is, is fine in this picture is the size. So we can do things at the size of a uh, of a blood cell, okay? So, but what we do is again look into nature. So how nature has done many machines, robots, or things that are moving. So we are very familiar with cancer cells, but also with bacteria, with viruses, and with what you see at the bottom are actually what we do in our lab. Things that resemble what we find in nature. But now the second point is how to make this moving and why do we want these nanoparticles to move? So the fact is that if we want to make nanoparticles that treat two more, this need to be very efficient. And there's a current paper, well, a few years ago, it's very controversial, saying, despite of the advances, only 0.7 of the nanoparticles designed to treat two more risks to the target. So we need to do something different. This is, like Laura was saying, this is a problem, and we need to find a solution. So our solution is to give this particle some propulsion, motion, that they can reach to the target efficiently. They can interact with the two more matrix. They can penetrate. They can talk to each other. They can collectively move. So the way we do is, in, in, in another way, will be like changing from passive to active transport, okay? But the nano scale, it, this is very, very challenging. I'm not gonna go into the details on how challenging it is, but here you can see a video on the, on one side, a particle that you put in solution, this is not gonna move. On the other side, you see a self-propelled particle, okay? And the way we do this, we take a particle and you put enzymes, these enzymes and catalysts we find in our body, and you can take a substrate then catalyze the reaction and move the fluid around and push the particle forward. And if this fuel, is this, this fuel, this substrate, is in our body, that will be ideal. So one ideal uh, body fluid will be blood, but this has some challenges. But urine has a big component, which is uh, urea, and urea is taken by the urease, and we make this reaction, okay? Anyway, I'm not gonna, again, go into detail, just to, there's a chemical reaction makes a chemical flow here. But life is not about individual uh, people, right? And about individual phenomena. Life is full of collective phenomena. How bacteria, how viruses invade, how uh, um, birds are moving, or how sperm cells uh, go to the egg, right? This is collectively. So that's what, how the future is going. So in the last five years, we managed to get a particle moving in solution to make it fully biocompatible. Now the challenge is how to understand from individual to collective. Okay, so if we want to put it inside the body, there was a, an article which says we need trillions of nanoparticles. How to make trillions of nanoparticles, how to put them inside the body, how to make them move, this is a challenge, as I said, for the next five to 10 years. So far, what we do is things that move, they can reach to, to these cells, they can reach two more cells, they can reach spheroids, which are 3D structure, similar to a tumor, and also in the last year, we managed to, to see them in vitro, in vivo, in a mice uh, bladder. So from the branch to the clinic, how far we are from this? So what the first thing we need to do, scientists, is to copy to do exactly the same protocols they do in the clinic, right? So what we do is we inject into the bladder exactly the same protocols, we inject these nanorobots, and then we bring the, the mice to the PET CT, to the imaging technique, and we see what happens. And then what happens is these nanorobotics are, um, are moving. You see this red cloud, these swarms moving all around the bladder so they can reach 
to the whole wall where the tumor is. So we make a treatment which is very, very efficient, much more compared to the typical treatments, like immunochemotherapy, where they only get to one side of, of, the, of the blood. Okay, so where we are, where we're going now, so nanotech work for, so many years ago, this was emerging, right? Then it's not only doing nano, but it's using it for something. We need to look into nature inspired by what is around us. We are finding some applications, not only medicine, but in our group, we are doing environmental application, how to clean water. We are doing sensors as well. We come from the same school as, as Laura from the biosensor group and for the future. So what are we doing is combining materials, physics, chemistry, also all the way to medicine. For you, we're gonna talk about this now in artificial intelligence. So now there's a lot of data there. So we want to do something that needs computer vision, uh, robotics control, mathematics, and etc. So thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. Thanks very much for your introduction. We will back to you in a few minutes. Our next panelist is Susana Marcos, who is meeting us online. Hi, Susana. She's David R. Williams, director of the Center for Visual Science, Nicholas George, professor of optics at the Institute of Optics and professor of ophthalmology, Flom Eye Institute at University of Rochester in New York City, New York, sorry. As a physicist pioneer in visual optics, she was recently appointed director of the Center for Visual Sciences in Rochester, an international reference center in vision research, with expert in optics, neuroscience, bioengineering, and ophthalmology. So please welcome Susanna. Would you like to tell us something about your specific work, please? Welcome. Absolutely. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and actually it's a real pleasure to have this event uh, in my hometown, uh, Salamanca, where I grew up and where I went to uh, college. Um, so maybe you can have my presentation uh, where I can uh, and I will be discussing a little bit of our research, um, our research that uh, actually um, is uh, about how to be able to see better. Um, and um, the, um, the the light um, the light that comes from from the from the world uh, hits our uh, retina, right? And uh, and it's projected by by. Um, part of ourselves uh, that allows us to see light, but also to see colors, to see shapes. And and this can go wrong. Um, and uh, what my lab does is really how to understand how the, how the eye works and how we can fix it in conditions that are um, very, very prevalent. So the eye is this uh, fascinating tool uh, that we use actually optical technologies, uh, much like the eye itself is, um, to, uh, to investigate. So, so we use light sources, we use optics to really understand uh, the uh, optical properties and, and the uh, uh, image forming capabilities of the cornea and the crystalline lens and how these uh, images that are projected by these lenses uh, are sampled by photoreceptors uh, in the back of the eye and how this information is actually going all the way to the brain and interpreted. Um, so the eye being um, as, uh, as exciting and as fascinating as it is has some imperfection. So, uh, one of the earlier technologies in my lab was actually uh, inherited from astronomy where um, ground-based based telescopes are based with um, wavefront sensors that uh, allow to, to measure the uh, optical uh, turbulences and, and the imperfections of the light going through the atmosphere. Well, we do that for, for the eye to characterize the errors of this eye. And this can go up to many different terms uh, probably the most well-known and the most important are refractive errors, like myopia. Um, and myopia, it's a condition that affects 30% of the population in Western countries. Um, some countries, some, some Asian populations, up to 90% in Hong Kong, in, in Singapore, is really a pandemic uh, for myopia. So we're, we're actually having the tools to understand why myopia develops and also uh, how to, uh, to correct it. Uh, interestingly, uh, visual impairment due to uncorrect refractive errors affects um, over 100 million of people worldwide. And it has been identified by the World Health Organization 
as uh, one thing to really uh, take care of. In fact, um, you can uh, improve uh, the quality of vision by uh, providing someone with glasses. And in fact, eyeglasses are one of the most cost-effective health care technologies. However, uh, the simple prescription of uh, getting you know, the, the eyes into a person uh, requires random optometries. There's one optometrist for, for uh, 6,000 people in, uh, in Western countries like USA or, or, or Europe. But you go to rural India, there's one optometrist every 250,000 people, um, uh, one optometrist per 1 million people in, in some parts of Africa. So when uh, the eye doctors come to, uh, to a village uh, uh, once in, in many years, uh, there's these long lines that are formed uh, to get a prescription. Um, what in collaboration with MIT we did uh, a few years ago was actually to develop a low cost ultra refractometer that is actually based on these wavefront sensors that we're taking from astronomy, uh, but actually brought into uh, a device that uh, can measure at the click of a button uh, the prescription of an eye. So that made into a clinical instrument and, and a commercial instrument uh, by Planoptica based in Boston. It's called Quixie and provides accurate ultra refraction everywhere. So we're bringing these uh, refraction um, measurements to uh, virtually every part of the world uh, very accurately. So we have these uh, corrections, uh, these, uh, these uh, imperfections like, like refractive errors. There's also other higher order aberrations uh, up to a few uh, um, dozens of, of aberrations that we can not only measure uh, with this technology but actually correct with similar tools that are uh, coupled with uh, ground-based telescopes to make the images of the universe uh, sharper. So what we can do is we actually can do uh, the images that are projected on the retina um, really sharp, you know, sharp, sharper as anyone can uh, have ever seen. And we can actually play and, and put someone's eyes and someone's imperfections in some other person's eyes. Uh, we can mimic different corrections and we can really explore how the brain interprets the images with, the, with, the, with new optics. And this is very relevant for, for corrections. Um, it's also very interesting to understand where these imperfections come from. So we have developed uh, 3D uh, fully quantitative uh, biometry tools, uh, anterior imaging systems, uh, where you can see here the cornea, the crystalline lens, maybe an intraocular lens implanted in the eye. Um, very accurately and very quantitatively. So we're shading light into uh, changes in the eye occurring with normal processes like accommodation. So what happens inside the eye when you're focusing near or far, what happens with the crystalline lens, for example, when uh, refractive errors, with, with, when myopia develops and what happens with aging. And there's uh, at least two conditions that are really prevalent that occur with aging. So one is presbyopia, uh, this is the, the uh, crystalline lens uh, losing its ability to focus, to accommodate, and this affects 100% of the population over the age of 45. This is 1.5 billion people worldwide. Or cataract, which happens later in age, uh, around 65 years of age, half of the population is affected, where the crystalline lenses loses transparency. Um, interestingly, cataract surgery is the most performed surgery in the world, in any hospital in the world. Uh, there's 28 million of cataract surgeries uh, per year in uh, worldwide. So we're developing these tools where we can now simulate visual correction. So uh, going from the lab, from these, uh, these uh, adaptive optics uh, based from astronomy, visual simulators like bulky instruments in very sophisticated in the lab, going into something that is uh, wearable, uh, head mounted and, and binocular, we are actually now uh, giving the patients uh, the um, experience of how a given correction in the eye is going to look like, like a new intraocular lens, for example, to correct for the depressed biopia or, or cataract. And again, this is one other system that has made all the way from the lab into the clinic. Uh, this is the Synvis uh, developed by our Spina company, uh, Twice Vision, that is actually changing how uh, intraocular lenses are prescribed and, and how uh, cataract surgery uh, is offered and, and also contact lenses are offered to patients. Um, learning and, and really understanding how the eye works has led us to uh, mimic 
um, some of the features of the, uh, of the crystalline lens in the young eye or to develop uh, different modalities of intraocular lenses. So for example, we have produced multifocal intraocular lenses that are now implanted in, in many people around the world, over 50 uh, countries. Um, or um, these, uh, which we believe are uh, the intraocular lenses of the future, uh, truly inspired by the crystalline lens that uh, change the shape uh, to uh, produce accommodation. But we're now producing these lenses that have the same capability, that can accommodate, that can change their shape uh, to focus dynamically and actually restoring vision uh, to um, the properties that the crystalline lens has in, in a young age. So in summary, uh, we're using optics, we're using light, uh, we're uh, based in a very multidisciplinary program where neuroscientists and optical engineers and biomedical engineers and chemists and ophthalmologists and optometrists work together uh, to uh, really increase eye care access, um, to um, improve cataract surgery, to uh, restore visual function. Um, in other words, we're using light and we're using the knowledge of optics um, and multidisciplinary um, understanding of the visual system to um, improve uh, vision. So I want to thank you all for your attention and I'm really looking forward to discussing uh, pressing uh, topics in, in, in research uh, with, uh, with you and, and the prominent scientists in the round table. And I thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thanks to you, Susanna. Uh, we'll be back to you in a few minutes. And last but not least, we have uh, one more panelist. She's Angeles Gomez Borrego, Vice President for International Affairs at the Spanish National Research Council, a geologist fighting against, uh, against climate change with several projects uh, around the world. She worked in the clean utilization of organic components in industrial processes at the Institute for Carbon Science and Technology in Oviedo. So please welcome Angeles, this is your turn. Thank you very much. I feel really honored to be here today to share the round table with so prestigious scientists and to be here in Salamanca, a town that I really like. You have a wonderful town here. I was told indeed to talk about uh, my research uh, when I came to this round table and uh, I thought that uh, I will talk about my path because I think that this might be of use for some of you uh, scientists, uh, young scientists uh, who are deciding or have to decide in which area you are going to work. And I will show you uh, what was my experience in, in my work, in which I uh, move or migrate a number of times of, uh, of research topic. And nothing uh, bad happens. So you don't have to be right from the beginning in your decision, or you don't have to stick to the first uh, decision you take in your uh, process, in your career. So uh, when, I, when I started to work, when I started uh, my PhD, which was uh, quite after you, uh, the, the time you are starting, uh, was, I was working with uh, something that uh, you really wouldn't like to listen now. It was petroleum source rock. Nowadays, we don't want to listen about petroleum because petroleum is dirty, because petroleum is uh, producing uh, greenhouse gases. But at the time, it was 30 years ago when I started, and I don't feel so old. It's, it was just at the end of the, of the last century. That was a hot topic for the petroleum industry where we have to put together the, the characteristics of the source rock and the oil, because you usually don't have to get these two, these two parts of the, of the vinomy. So and, uh, it was important, it was relevant to have uh, good correlations between parameters you could extract from one or another, uh, another rock, another stuff, 
in order to try to find good uh, source rock oil correlations, which were helping in the uh, oil exploration. You think I can have the... Yes. You have to... Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I have to do myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was an example of the kind of molecules we can find in the, in the oil, these complex organic uh, molecules, and uh, how the organic matter you have in the rock is looking like. Afterwards, this was the, the, first, topic, the first topic in which uh, I was working, Afterwards, uh, I moved, uh, after returning from, uh, from Germany, I was uh, coming into a group which were dealing with improving uh, the quality of product, uh, products coming from uh, coal utilization. Again, coal, something we don't like nowadays because it has the, the, the memories of uh, dirty stuff but it was very relevant to try to optimize the coal quality in the steel production, and is still something we need to do to try to, to study and to optimize the reactivity of the different components we see in this pink image with uh, different uh, colors and different shapes, and the distribution, the size, the, the, the position, determines the quality of the coke in the high oven. In the same way, when we burn coal, we uh, can have different structures which are responsible of the final efficiency, and we can act on these parameters, on these, uh, on these uh, variables, in order to optimize the process and minimize the amount of unburned carbon in the ashes. If you optimize the process, you are saving energy. If you optimize the process, you are taking care of the environment because you are having less residues at the end. At that moment, when we were working or busy with this, it, in the clear, it became clear that the fossil fuels were uh, producing uh, massive amounts of green gases, and therefore it was necessary to uh, stop to produce uh, from coal or fossil fuel ut utilization these uh, green gases, this CO2. Then we were working in different technologies for uh, trying to mitigate this uh, CO2 release to the atmosphere. And this, I must say, it was something like uh, 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, it was a golden time for the clean coal technologies. Everybody tried to find different solutions because at that moment uh, the scientists and the, uh, and the technologists were really sure that only producing or uh, deploying clean coal technologies was going to be the solution to really fight against climate change. Luckily, the uh, wind energy, the solar energy, when faster in the research, and this is something also which is important to strengths, that uh, we need to explore different solutions, we need to explore different uh, ways to address the, the questions, to address the problems, in a way that uh, at the end we will be lucky with any, or with some of them, or with many of them, which will, the, will be the winners, no? will be the last ones which uh, will be uh, in place. No? Well, after that, uh, I turned back because at that moment it was already clear that uh, climate change uh, was uh, one of our worries and that we need to, to, to find solution for, uh, solutions for that, but also we need to find evidences to support all the uh, changes we were already observing. So these models these needed to be uh, more robust and needed to be more solid. Then we went back to the, to the origins, to these organic geochemical studies, and we apply this, this formation, this, uh, this background, in the uh, study of peat as paleoarchives in order to reconstruct the, the climate in the last uh, 10,000, 12,000 years. 
So this brings us uh, this kind of, of studies. I was working in peat, but other people were working on ice cores or on tree uh, rims or on coral rims. So there are many, many ways to address this, uh, this question and to find for how was the climate in the past where we were not able to measure uh, direct uh, measurements. And as an, as an example, I show you the, a couple of conclusions from the previous uh, IPCC uh, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change conclusions. And in uh, 2014, it was written, it is extremely likely that the warming observed in the last 50 years is due to anthropogenic uh, input. And just uh, three weeks ago, the last uh, report uh, came out, and uh, all the work that the scientists have done in this period has, uh, so has been translated into this inequivocally due to the emissions from human activities. So this change in the, uh, between extremely likely and inequivocally due is due to an enormous amount of studies and enormous amount of data treatment to put them together. So now we are, uh, now I am more in uh, management uh, activities and believe me if I tell you that we are really worried in trying to uh, put the information the scientists produce in a way that the stakeholders, the politicians, are able to understand and to take, the, in order to take the measures to uh, help our planet and ourselves in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Angeles. <laughs> we will start now with the round table, but um, before starting it, uh, let me remind you that if you want to make any question to one of our scientists, um, and if you are watching us through the virtual platform, you can use the hashtag uses2021 to make one of those questions. So shall we begin with the round table, if you don't mind? So the first um, block is um, climate change. I would like to start with Angeles, for example, if you don't mind. Um, and I would like to, um, to ask you how important it is to know the danger um, climate change um, can cause in, in, in our daily life and how science can fight against it and, and improve the society, if it is possible? I think, uh, well, it's, uh, it's uh, very important, clearly, that we, uh, we know how this uh, climate change can affect our, our society and that we can measure also, we can give quantitative data on how it's going to affect because uh, if we talk about, yeah, it's going to be very dangerous, it's going to be uh, terrible, uh, big uh, uh, disasters, uh, so more frequent floods, uh, more fire, it's, it's true, this, this is going to happen because uh, this is something which we are already realizing. Because of the climate change directly. Because of the climate change directly. This last report is clear on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, the extreme events are directly caused the uh, uh, abundance and frequency of the extreme events is directly caused by the climate change. Mm -hmm. so it, it, but uh, it is also important that we take into account that it's not only the climate what is going to, say, uh, to change. There are a lot of uh, things which are affected. Our way to feed ourselves, our way to produce the food. So there are a lot of research needed in this area of new, new aliments, new, uh, new foods that can be produced in, uh, with less water, in uh, more extreme conditions, which are not uh, appropriate for the species we have right now. There are going to be migrations that we have to take into account because of the climate. So there are a lot of things, not only the, the rise of, on the sea level, which is something which is very evident mm -hmm. and is, is probably the first uh, thing which is going to affect but there are going to be much more effects in the society, and this is also going to be very expensive 
to solve that. Mm -hmm. So to have this cost of this disaster in the equation may help the stakeholders to decide that uh, uh, taking the measures, which are also expensive, to stop the climate change might be uh, more convenient than solving the problems created because of that. And that's why we have to be very conscious with, with, this, with this time. So, um, Susana, for example, I, I think you can uh, listen to us. Uh, how do you think climate change has to be considered in, in science project? Yeah, well, that's that's a question that it doesn't relate to my um, specific uh, field of research. But uh, I think something that has been clear from everyone's presentations is how uh, connected uh, research is across fields and how research these days is fully multidisciplinary. I think we've heard from Samuel linking robotics and, yeah. and, and biology and, and medicine. We've heard from from Laura about you know, bioengineering, but uh, with an application in, in medicine. So I think all of these fields are, are connected. So um, what I would say is that in everything we do and in everything, uh, in every research field that we cover and everything we do in uh, our daily lives, everything is connected and everything can have an impact impact on, on the environment and, and on climate change. Um, and um, we all need to uh, put resources into that and we all need to think in in the in the products that we may um, deploy as part of our research to be conscious about sustainability and I think in in my area of research we're uh, working and, and thinking on you know like green chemistry for um, uh, the the biomaterials that we use in in the eye um, we are conscious about um, sustainability of the um, of the tools that we use in, in in surgery. So all these, I think, is is very important to have in mind that everything is connected, and that everything that we do may have an impact in in fields out, outside um, and and protecting the environment and protecting the planet. The planet should be a number one priority for for everything we do. Do you want to add something? Yeah, 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 following on that, so I think it's a great point that, that she made, right? Like be open and connect mm -hmm. all the ideas and, and open to serendipity, right? So I yes. actually was uh, invited to this European summit that, uh, well, the summit that you, proposed, you, you explained today, right? And for Madrid, there was another parallel about uh, European Council. So I was presenting part of my work on nanorobotics and how can we clean water. So it was not planned to do that, but, but you see things moving, things that can generate because of chemical reactions, something in water and you can clean, right? So why not to use it and invest, invest some money that convince the stakeholders that, that any science, not that the, the one that doing only geology or any other department from our departments can, can be used for society, right? So water is one of these right sustainability and development goals right we need to be very careful in the in the future because there will be less water in in some countries right and drinkable water so use technology and new materials to clean it uh, that, that would be one of the main points right so be open to that and connect connect the ideas mm -hmm. all the areas has to be connected Laura yes what I want to say also is that of course science can provide many answers and then we can be all connected all together mm -hmm. and we I mean, science has already demonstrated during the, this pandemic that we have been able to solve the pandemic due to science. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the same for the climate change and for the, all the environmental issues. I mean, science can provide the answer. But the problem is that we need the involvement of all the society. Yeah. We need the involvement of the politicians, mm -hmm. the stakeholders. And this is the problem for us. I mean, we can do many things in science. But of course, we need involving of everybody. It's not only the scientists that we yeah. have to just to fight that to say, okay, we can do that and we can solve this and this. But we need, of course, the support of all of you. I mean, of everybody of the society and especially the politicians, because mm -hmm. it's the only way to stop this uh, this uh, big, huge problem that we have. Because this pandemic is, was also related to the problem with the climate change, with the environmental issues, with the. I mean, with the forbidden habitats, habitats that we are just entering. So we have to be aware that uh, we have a real, I mean, a huge problem, and it's the time to solve it. 
Mm -hmm. We will yeah. talk about pandemic, but yeah, and it, yeah, it is related. Actually, yeah. Yeah. There is actually a, a very clear impact of climate change yeah. in epidemics. And Into the epidemics, yeah. Which are especially the, those diseases that have been transmitted by vectors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The mosquitoes, that are an habitat that is in tropical and subtropical areas. I'm talking about Anopheles that transmits malaria, and the Aedes mosquito that transmits chikungunya, mm -hmm. dengue, yellow fever and Zika. These diseases have been confined into tropical countries, but because of the expansion of the habitat of the mosquitoes that now can reach to regions that become now with a climate that is more moderate, now we are seeing dengue cases in areas of the world where there were before no dengue cases. And that's because the mosquito has arrived to these places because now the climate is more favorable to mm -hmm. the mosquito. Mm -hmm. So there are all these consequences of climate change in terms of economy, in terms of resources, in terms of infectious diseases, and that's something that is one of the clear, clear problems of, of, of mankind that needs to be solved, and the science needs to play a major role in solving the problem of climate change. It's all connected, yeah, isn't it? Then we will talk about pandemics, and, and I will introduce um, a new, a new blog, which is uh, artificial intelligence, and I think it's quite important to uh, to be focused on this point, because, for mm -hmm. example, um, Samuel, um, I would like to talk about the importance of the study of, of data, big data. Mm -hmm. um, how important is that in science? Because nowadays we see every day um, a big uh, yeah. amount of, of data. And how can we use this information, for example, to fight against climate change, pandemics, etc.? Well, in, in terms of artificial intelligence, I think we should divide in two blocks, right? Like the software, the big data, yeah. analysis, right? All the algorithms and the, and the hardware. Stuff, yeah. Hardware will be more the robotics itself, the humanoids, like uh, like the big machines in, in the industry, right? So either w one or the other that will be in the future among us, and, and it's clear, they're right now here, right? But uh, regarding the data and connecting to the pandemics, right? They will be, and, and in the daily life of our research, we're creating more and more data, right? There, mm. There's more sensitivity in the machines where we are creating something um, that, well, big computers that we can accumulate a lot of data and we need to understand uh, very quickly. We need to be very agile also, not only in the company using these words, right? But using in, in, the, in the science to interpret this data right, and analyze it and also predict what's going to happen in the future. So we need to keep predicting what's going to happen, right, the climate change, right? And, and this is thanks to um, analysis, artificial intelligence, machine learning, right, neural network networks, like making them learn themselves. So my, my suggestion for everyone here in the audience or whoever is, 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 is listening, so we keep seeing this more often in the CBs. So I have no idea about algorithm. I have no idea about programming. But that has to be a must, right, in every CB when, when we see it, because they need to have at least some, some hints and some background, some knowledge on that, because it's going to be in, in the daily life in the future, right? So very, very, very important. Right? And, and talking about robots, for example, we have uh, one of the first questions uh, okay. our students oh, yeah. have made us, for example, for um, Professor Adolfo or Samuel. Um, yeah, they say, what are the advantages of yes. nanorobots in comparison with, the ex uh, for example, receptor uh, charged Cancer that's, treatment methods. That's per, that, that, no, that's a perfect question, actually. Like, um, so uh, we talk about uh, vectors, about yeah. particles that can transport drugs, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, these particles cannot, um, let's say, drill into tissue, interact with extracellular matrix, right, or, or reach to the target efficiently. So, of course, you need. So, in our case, we also have antibodies to target. So, we are we are doing is to help in this short range interaction. So when you go to a tumor, there's uh, interstitial flow pressure that pulls the particle away. So if you have enough force to penetrate this, interact, and also I like very much what you, you, you said, right, about the, the viral, like with the cells and the respond to immune system to, to make the cells interact with mm -hmm. this, this artificial system that we put there. So the advantage will be the cell propulsion and the interaction. We have demonstrated that you can drill much better, penetrate into cells, tissues, and tumors than something that doesn't interact with it. Yeah, and, and it's all, not only a question of advantages or disadvantages, it's a question of cooperation between these things. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so you can use advancing technology to take all technology and then make yeah. it better. 
So that, that's, the, yeah. that's the beauty of all the tools that they yeah. are now inside. Of, co of course. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it, we are in a very in exciting uh, times in science with all the things that we can do, all the information we can get. Mm. Uh, and actually the challenge is how to use the information in a better way uh, with all the tools that we have in order to make uh, really impacts in the big things that, that happen, like is quality of life, mm -hmm. like is uh, climate change, like is uh, uh, trying to get uh, and to stop the next pandemic that it comes. Yeah, and I would like to know as well, um, how um, has artificial intelligence, for example, has changed the science and, and if, it, if science has changed the artificial intelligence, so something like vice versa? Any of you, yeah. Well, as I said, like um, maybe five, seven years ago, when now, well, let's say seven to ten years ago, when I was in the lab, like still analyzing my data, well, by clicking mm. video by video, very slow process. And now all my group members, they just get a lot of videos, a lot of data, and they can easily, in a couple of hours, analyze what I was able to analyze in one month. So this is, these algorithms are helping there, of course. So the way without this, this, let's say, this swimming intelligence, this cooperative intelligence that I'm just proposing here, right, um, we cannot think about any application in the future. So then the robots, whatever is happening in the industry, like the robotic system, how things cooperate and the robots can talk to each other, mm -hmm. this is something that they are much faster than we do at the nanoscale, so we need to learn from that. So everything is moving so fast. What we don't, we should not do is to stick to our own problem, our own technologies. That's what we're doing here, right? Like listen to each other and try to get some ideas that I was re I'm already getting from each, each of them and from the question, of course. Listen to the question that every time, like, uh, like I have questions from the audience, like I go back to the lab and my, my people suffer, like, oh, there's something new that's gonna happen here, but um, things will change very quickly, right? Talking about technology, we have another question, this for Susana. Um, Susana, uh, our students say that, uh, do you consider that cellulose layer are a promising way to, to treat eye injuries? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question because, I mean, it's not cellulose layer, but uh, another type of uh, biomaterial uh, coming from nature is actually the, um, the topic, the, the central theme of, uh, of our new ERC advanced brand uh, called Silk Eye. So yeah, uh, it's um, the standard of care right now for wounds in the cornea is actually putting an amnion membrane uh, on top of the, um, of the, of the, of the cornea to, uh, to favor the wound healing um, of, a, of, a, of an injured cornea. Um, but by placing uh, other uh, biomaterials that are readily access accessible in, in, in nature, and this is what we are doing with, uh, with silk, uh, silk fibrin, um and polymers based on that. We're actually being able to recreate what uh, you can do with this amnion membrane, but now this is, uh, this is not allogenic material, it's readily access accessible, it's affordable, um, so yeah, um, looking into what nature can provide us and, and, and harness it to our interests is, um, I think it's, um, it's very important in, in many different uh, research fields and, and we're using it for um, the, the question of, the, of uh, healing the cornea as the person that made the question suggested. So, yep. Mm -hmm. Talking about this, um, things about how, how technology changes everything. Um, do you have any pieces of, of advice for, for our students, for example, because I think they have to be very up to date with everything. So um, do you have any advice to give them uh, just to say you have to be or do you have to know everything because things change, in, uh, things change every, day, every day. So um, for example, uh, Laura, have, have you got any advice of, of this stuff? Advice. Well, this is difficult, but of course, I mean, it's not possible to know everything. Yeah. So, and sometimes it's better just to try to focus on one mm -hmm. thing and to be an expert on that, and then to try just, I mean, just, and not to try to, I mean, to know uh, uh, just small pieces of everything. So, my main, ad main advice is if you want to do for a scientific career, is that you choose what you like more. I mean, you can go for pure science, you can go for engineering, you can go for chemistry, physics, and so on. But just try to, I mean, to have a very strong 
background on that. And after that, I mean, you can specialize, you can do many other things, even if you are studying physics or chemistry or whatever, it doesn't matter because all of us, for example, like Samuel and myself, I have a background in chemistry, mm -hmm. a PhD in physics, and then I have been working in engineering, in biology, mm -hmm. in medicine. Mm -hmm. But it's better if you start having a very, very strong background at least in one discipline. And after that, you can specialize in what you like more. I mean, if you can use physics to do medicine, you can, do, you can do, uh, use uh, technology uh, to do uh, environmental uh, um, studies, whatever. Uh, so my main advice is not try to cover everything. That's mm -hmm. not possible for, any, for, mm -hmm. <laughs> for nobody. But my main advice is first start having a strong background in one discipline, the discipline that you like much more. And then after that, then you have time to also to find where you can do and it's multidisciplinary. Uh, you can acquire a multidisciplinary um, uh, knowledge by yourself, but depending what you like more and what you, you like to focus more. Mm -hmm. um, we had another question, but maybe we, ha we have to keep on talking about because we have yeah, lots of sure. stuff to, to do. So um, the third block is um, pandemics, which is related, for example, with climate change. We, we, we used to talk uh, before. So, um, Professor, for example, uh, you've been working on improving everyone's lives uh, during this pandemic. Uh, you have research on the development of antivirals and vaccines against, against COVID-19. So, um, will we have to deal with new pandemics in the future? Yeah, unfortunately, pandemics are not uh, finishing with this one. Um, we you mean that this is just the beginning or what? No, not the beginning, it's just the continuation <laughs> yeah, of a long <laughs> history. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if we are lucky, our generation will not see another pandemic, but uh, sooner or later another pandemic is going to happen. And, you know, it's not only pandemics, there are specific outbreaks that can cause a lot of problems in a specific region of the world. Uh, outbreaks of Ebola, outbreaks of Nipah virus, uh, um, multi-resistant bacteria that may become uh, little by little, not sudden like happened with these pandemics, but little, little more prevalent and then causing more disease. This is, this is something that we are going to need to deal all the time. Um, there is a lot of biodiversity and, uh, in the world, um, a lot of viruses lurking that uh, sooner or later they are going to evolve a little bit and then, and then going into, into us. That's, that's happening all the time, often. Not not so much in one generation, but over several generations, a big pandemic happens. And the question is to be ready for that. It's, and it's not only science. It's always a question of the society, the society mm. being prepared to deal also logistically when these things happen. But in terms of science, it's clear what we need to do. We need to find much better what is around in order to be more aware of the dangers, find treatments that are more broad spectrum, that will be able to cover not only specific pathogens, but multiple pathogens and multiple families that target conserved areas in pathogens that belong to the same family, and some of them may have never caused pandemics, like what happened with the, this coronavirus that came, um, and vaccines, vaccines that are, again, more broad spectrum, that will be able to cover not only one single pathogen, but if it's, we target regions that are specific for families of pathogens, then we will be better in terms of having at least weapons that are for the treatment and prevention of the new things that come. And then in terms of prevention, there is a lot of things that also need to be done, and that science can help on that, like uh, what, what is the best way, how to contain things to, to prevent jumps from nature or from wild animals to domestic animals, to people, which is how these things happen, how these new viruses come in. It's not that they are suddenly coming from nowhere. They are somewhere, and then at one moment they get in contact with a human. And if it is the right circumstance for the virus, then it's when the, the virus comes, and that's what it does, like this COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Laura, do you think we can do anything, if it's possible, uh, for try to avoid new pandemics, or if it's impossible? No, 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 I mean, it's possible. I think that one problem also with this pandemic is that we forgot to do all these surveillance uh, uh, studies that we are doing. 
uh, for, the, for the evolution of coronavirus because, uh, as you remember, we have already another coronavirus mm -hmm. a few years ago, the SARS-CoV-1. SARS mm -hmm. And after that, they decided just to do all these studies using all the diagnostic techniques to do the studies of the surveillance and, the, and to prevent future outbreak. But then they was stopped by the politician, of course, and then mm -hmm. it was not enough resources uh, to continue. But now we have to be completely aware that we need to be controlling what is happening because we have thousands of other coronavirus that can uh, eventually just go, go into the, to the human. So we need to develop all this uh, diagnostics technology that you are able to make a very early diagnostic and also to make all this uh, early surveillance of any outbreak of any coronavirus that can jump again to the, to the human people. And also, as uh, Adolfo say, we have, um, I mean, we have even now suffering what we call the silence pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the silence pandemic is due to bacteria. We have now the problem that the bacteria, which are very intelligent, they are mutated in such a way they are completely they are destroying all the antibiotics. We don't have almost now, there are all these super bacteria that are, are able just to, that they cannot, we, cannot, we don't have any antibiotic against this bacteria. And we have some prediction that by the year 2050, it's going to be more people that are going to die due to this super bacteria than to cancer. And this is the number. So millions of people are dying every year due to this silence pandemic. So we have to be able to produce new diagnostic, a very early diagnostic, I mean, to know who is getting infected and then to try to give a treatment as soon as possible. So this is something that, of course, I mean, diagnostic and then treatment and then mass things, everything have to be together. But we have to focus on that because we are facing huge problem for the future. Mm -hmm. Talking about diagnosis, diagnosis, for example, we have another question for Professor Adolfo. Uh, one of our students say, um, uh, are you or are you saying or are you telling us that it will be a vaccine for cancer? It is, it is not so... Um, <laughs> outrageous to think uh, about vaccine for cancer. Therapeutic vaccines, there is a lot that is been talked about potential therapeutic vaccines against cancer. And, but, you know, the vaccine against cancer is, even if before cancer appears, can you get vaccinated against cancer? And in fact, we have a vaccine against cancer, which is against papilloma. Mm -hmm. Cervical cancer and some of the cancers that are caused by papilloma viruses, we have now a vaccine that is able to prevent papillomavirus infection, and therefore prevent cervical cancer. And in the future, if we know better about what antigens the cancer cells have that are mm. specific for cancer cells that happens in cancers that are common, or we can predict what person will likely to have a cancer that has these particular antigens, if we know that, then we could in theory, be able to make a vaccine, the same thing that has been done for papilloma viruses. So it's not so outrageous, and I think, uh, um, hopefully I see it in my lifetime, uh, but it's up to the young people that are right now mm -hmm. starting to do science to go and then, mm -hmm. and then doing the real job and then finding these things. Samuel. Yeah, this is, this is something uh, very nice, and, and, and this type of personalized medicine, right, for the future as well. So if you can, I mean, we, we can get also cells, tumor for patient, and understand these with the antigens that are expressed on each type of, of patient, and then develop these particle robot or, or, or vaccines, right, on, almost on demand, not for each of us, but for subpopulations, and that will be more specific for the future. I think this is possible, it's here, right, uh, it's available, but we need, we need to listen and empower to scientists, yeah. that's yeah. My, my statement connected to what uh, you said in the, in, to, to us, to Laura, right, so probably many of these things and the future pandemics and the future disease is something that we might know and might be around, but we just need to listen to us, right? It's, pro it's probably not as simple as, as I say, but the principle is there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the demonstration of the principle is there with the, the, the papilloma cancer vaccine, the cervical cancer vaccine. So the principle is there, it's a question of, of using the resources that are needed in order to understand much better this, this concept mm -hmm. and then coming out finally with solution. Mm -hmm. Not today, but uh, <laughs> hopefully in the future. We wish. Um, 
We are running out of time, but I, I would like to introduce the, the last of our four different blocks, uh, which is pseudoscience. And for example, Angeles, I would like you to, um, to say something about, for example, we are talking about vaccines, we are, about, we are talking about um, virus, for example. And what do you think about, for example, uh, anti-vaccines, people, or, or different opinions? Well, um, uh, if we talk about pseudoscience, mm. in two words, I would say <laughs> pseudoscience, no, thank you. It's a good resume. Yeah, <laughs> this is, uh, the, we can take the slogan of the nuclear, uh, mm -hmm. against nuclear energy for this, because I think it's, it's, really, it's really dangerous. No? It's a collection of uh, statements, beliefs, uh, practices, which are not based uh, on, on science, but claim to be based on that, and therefore is particularly dangerous for that. And then uh, uh, with uh, vaccines, uh, of course, uh, is the same story. No? They, are, they are feeding this, uh, this feeling that, uh, uh, and, and explaining, probably you know better, that there uh, are uh, so problems with, uh, with the vaccines, with uh, any medication or whatever, which is going to cause uh, disease or problems greater than the ones to be solved, which is not true, is not based in any scientific uh, record, scientific proof, but uh, is said and there are always people who believe that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have we always have um, civil science, or is it something new or, or something, no, Laura? I, I would like to say that, uh, I mean, that these people, that they don't believe in the vaccine, they don't mm -hmm. believe in, in, I mean, they think that this is not so. I mean, they should think, okay, 100% of the, all the scientists in the world, all of us, we are completely in favor of the vaccine. We are completely in favor on developing treatment, on diagnostic, and we, are, and, we, and we are trying to manage this pandemic. We are completely in favor of passing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think these people have to think, if we are the expert, and the 100% of the experts are all around the world, all of us, I mean, we are completely in favor of the thing. Yeah, they are and telling they should, the same they thing. They should yeah. believe us. I mean, and they mm. should believe that we are the experts, and all the experts are saying the same. So this is, I think, the best demonstration that the vaccines are working and the people should think that we, I mean, we have, uh, we have been educated, we have been, uh, in, uh, spent so much time of our life, I mean, just uh, in, in, in science. And if we, all the scientists around the world were thinking on that, I mean, that the vaccines are the correct way to control the pandemic, they should believe us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think the main question is here just what the data says, right? And it's very clear vaccines are saving life. You just need to see the data, what is happening in places where there is vaccine use, what is happening in places where there is no vaccine use. So there is no question about it. I think one important consideration that we need to do with pseudoscience is first that science is not perfect. We as scientists can be wrong. There is a lot of debate in some areas and some theories that are different from others. And that's actually healthy. Mm. Someone thinks that with the data that it has, this is the interpretation that it has, and someone else come. I'm not sure that this is the interpretation because I think you are missing this point. Uh, this, this is healthy debate. But there is some other debate that is, there are so much data that says already that this is actually of benefit. Um, that, that is, uh, I mean, and, and that's the question, I guess, for the general public is, how to distinguish between things that are still debatable among scientists, things that science don't know, mm. scientists don't know at this moment, and things that are actually a period fakes, of future, right? Yeah. Fakes, fake science is thing that does not have any scientific evidence that happens like that. And not only that, but all the data contradicts mm. anything that is uh, based on, on a theory like the vaccines are not working, or COVID-19 doesn't exist. <laughs> this is also some, some of the things that we can they hear say, from, from yeah. here and there. But there is no virus around. It's just what they want. scientists want us, and politicians want us to tell, that there is a virus around to control us. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a pity that, that some people think like that. I think it's mainly a question of education. I think it's not mm. easy to solve, but hopefully with more education in the future, these type of things are less and less prevalent. Yeah, just to finish, because we are running out of time, um, I would like um, you to give 
as, as Laura did before, uh, um, a little advice for our audience, our young talent. So in a minute, for example, each of one of you, I would like uh, to give them uh, a little advice. For example, we can, we can start with you, Susana, if you don't mind. Yeah, so what I would say to everyone is just um, follow your passions. Um, I think uh, no challenge is, is too big if uh, you really believe in what you're doing uh, and you really have you know, the, the power uh, to, to undertake it. And also, um, yes, uh, use all the opportunities that are around you. Um, so, so I think um, I think it's not only luck. It's really it's really catching the opportunities and make the most of them to learn and to um, interact with the you know with the people that can guide you and 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 getting help from others. Um, but really. Um, I mean, if you have a dream and you have a passion, uh, there is something you want to investigate and, and change the world, uh, go for it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Angeles, for example, your little advice. <laughs> keep on learning and don't be afraid to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, keep on trying. Great advice. Samuel? Well, I was always talking about passion in, in yeah. my talks in the past, but... Um, and uh, now to don't replicate, it's make the best out of your time. So use all the opportunities we have out there. And don't waste your time, like go and visit. This is a global world. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the knowledge, the information, the data is out there. So you have a lot of time over summer. You are very active students, right? So go to one lab, go to another lab and find these patient, patients, right? Like whatever you love. Maybe you don't know what you love, but you'll find it on the way, right? And, and be very active. as. All the students who are here are extremely active. If they are here, they are on the right path. So, yeah, probably they don't need too much advice, but enjoy your time. Yeah. Laura, shortly, have you got any other advice? <laughs> yes, uh, my advice is, um, okay, we need more, more scientists. We need a lot of science in the future. Mm. And especially, I want to give a message to all the women. We need more women scientists. So please, uh, yes, all the women, we can do a great work. And then please believe mm. in yourself. And at least, Professor. Yeah, I think, I think it's clear, follow your path. You see us. You, you can see that we love our work. Yeah. <laughs> and despite all the frustrations, there is a lot of frustrations in science. Mm -hmm. But we scientists, we love what we do. And there is not so many professions that you can say, I love, what I, I love my work. And, and science is one of them. So if you feel science is your vocation. You have the talent. Don't waste your talent. Just go for the science. Follow your passion. It's something, it's a, it's a job that you will find that you love it, even despite all the frustrations. And that's, that's great in life. And also, you do something for society. It's, it's, mm. it's a great job. Mm -hmm. Thank you, all of you, for this inspiring conversation and all the advices. I hope uh, our young audience uh, has enjoyed it as much as I did. And of course, learned from, from these professionals who are some of the most prominent scientists in the, in the world, and um, indeed, that's one of the main goals of, of this event, to feed your curiosity, and that's why we gave you, um, to our contestants and, and our on-site spectators, a, a very special gift, um, as a metaphor of this uh, spirit, a, a tiptoe. I don't know if, if you know what it is. Uh, some of you will be wondering what a tiptoe uh, is. It's really easy, it's, it's a toy that when spinning, uh, spontaneously inverts to rotate on e its own shaft. Um, the phenomenon of the type tobe has fascinated the world of scientists since uh, the 1800s, including Nobel um, laureates such as Winston Churchill, for example, Niels Bohr, Wolfgang Pauli. The fact that um, when the tiptoe inverts, it also changes the direction on, on the, of the rotation. Uh, the same effect, for example, can be accomplished with an American football or, um, or a hard-boiled egg. We have, we have um, a video in which we can see this effect, for example, and if you can read, it's, it's, uh, this video shows how to distinguish a boiled egg from a not one. So um, uh, if it turns normally, it is um, a row, a crude egg, you can see it, but if when turning it stands on its longest axis, it is a boiled egg. 
This simple object, this <laughs> tiptoe, uh, summarizes the messages behind this contest uses. Uh, the first of them is stay curious. Why does the tiptoe invert it in its spinning? The answer is in size, science. Everything is science. We have been talking about it. And secondly, teamwork in science, Laura said before, teamwork is absolutely required. Mm, as an example, for example, we, we were watching the, that photographs, Niels Bohr and Wolf, Wolfgang Pauli were found discussing about the physics behind the type toe spin. So it is a nice story, isn't it? Now it is uh, the time to say goodbye. I would like to thank uh, our viewers uh, for watching us and for the passion about science. Um, you are a um, seed of our future. I will take this time to thank as well our sponsors. Uh, your support to this event is key to keep empowering young scientists. Um, and thanks again to all of you for being here with us this afternoon. And remember, tomorrow we will get to know the winners of this con uh, contest. So do not miss the award ceremony uh, to find out who are the winners. So see you tomorrow. Thank you very much for being here, for accompanying us. And thank you. Gracias. Me des puedes conectar, ¿verdad?